Hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, latest edition of our AHUB series, which is a thought leadership uh, initiative of India Business Centre. And uh, in KHUB, we bring out uh, leading experts and uh, thought leaders in the domain of foreign trade for their insights into this highly dynamic and exciting environment. Today, uh, in this uh, C edition, we are inviting Dr. Bibek Ray Chaudhary, who is professor at Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, Kolkata campus, as a speaker in, in uh, this episode. Dr. Chaudhary did his PhD in economics from Jawaharlal Nehru University and is currently professor of economics at IIT Kolkata. He started his career as a consultant at National Council for Applied Economic Research, a leading think tank in New Delhi, and was a visiting fellow at School of Environment, Education and Development at the University of Manchester, UK. His research interests include trade, microfinance and political marketing. He has been published in journals like the Journal of Business Research, LCV, uh, Market Intelligence and Planning, Emerald, Journal of Political Marketing, Taylor and Francis, Journal of Industrial Statistics, Journal of Asian Business Studies, Emerald, and he was also re recipient of the prestigious Japanese Award, award for Outstanding Research on Development conferred by the Ministry of Finance, Government of Japan and Global Development Network. Personally, he is an avid traveler and likes to visit places. Other hobbies include reading and sports. Today, we are going to discuss with Dr. Chaudhary uh, a very critical topic pertaining to India's uh, FTA negotiations with the uh, European Union and in this regard, how they affect or how they could potentially affect the agricultural trade between the two countries. So uh, welcome Dr. Chaudhary and thank you so much for being part of this series with us today. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bari, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you on this very important issue. Thank you, sir. So starting with the uh, discussion on this issue, uh, my first question is that how do you view the agricultural trade basket between India and the EU at present? Which products are currently driving trade and what is the degree of complementarity between these two partners? Okay, so uh, actually the trade between uh, EU and India in agricultural products are quite substantial. And if you look at what kind of products EU is uh, sending to India in these categories, then the major products would be tobacco, uh, then products of milling, starch, malt, miscellaneous edible oils, preparations, and animal and vegetable oil. These are the major products which are being sent by EU to India. And uh, whereas if you look at India's exports to EU, it is majorly comprising of animal vegetable oils, coca and coca preparations, vegetable plating materials, residues of uh, you know waste from the food industry, sugar and sugar confectionery. So these are the major products actually which are driving the trade between uh, EU and India. We of course have done some studies uh, you know, in this regard and where we could also bring out uh, some of the products which might be coming up uh, while uh, you know these countries uh, will uh, negotiate in different rounds. As you know that for you uh, almost uh, we have completed seven rounds and uh, there are uh, many such uh, products have come up and there is an inclusion list from uh, EU side, there's an inclusion list from, uh, sorry, a exclusion list from EU side, there's an exclusion list from India's side and India's exclusion list actually majorly comprises of the agricultural products. Whereas the use, uh, you know, exclusion list doesn't, uh, maybe one or two products are there, but mostly they are, uh, you know, ceramic and plastics and other kinds of products. So, uh, if you look at the, you know, uh, you know, the whole ecosystem of uh, this, uh, you know, trade between India and EU and uh, in agricultural products, and if we keep the FTA negotiations in the forefront, then what I feel is that uh, there is a huge potential Already, uh, you know, there are studies which have been done in that regard. There's a huge potential in agricultural trade between these two countries. But of course, there are certain concerns which are there. And the concerns, as we go forward, we'll explain that majorly they are to do with uh, the non-tariff barriers that are there. And uh, that is mostly from 
uh, use side and uh, from India's side, the average tariffs are quite high. Uh, so uh, if the FTA negotiations are only concentrating on tariffs, then what is going to happen is the major benefits are going to go to the European Union and India doesn't benefit much from that. So we have done certain estimations and from that, that's what we are getting. Um, okay. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, response and uh, giving us a, an overview of the trade potential between the two partners. So what are the major challenges, as you were just mentioning, which you would like to elaborate further on to agricultural trade growth between India and the EU? And how do you think they can be addressed? Okay. So I'll just uh, give some data on that. So we just uh, took some data right from 1990. Uh, 2000, 2010, 2020, if you look at the average tariff which India has imposed on EU agricultural products, then it has changed from 75% in 1990 to 40% in 20, uh, 2000, 33% in 2010, and again it is now 36% in 2020. So I would say that these are quite high. Uh, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, the tariffs, it's very high, in fact, uh, as an average tariff. And if you look at which are the products on which these are highest, then the highest would be on beverages, spirits and vinegar. The average tariffs were as high as 266%. And today it stands at around 170%. So, which means that there are certain products which India is I think very vigorously, you know, protecting and that has to do with our domestic industry, that has to do with livelihood of the people who are related to that. We know that even after so many years of independence, 41% of our people are still dependent on agriculture. And so uh, the government of India as a, you know, proclaimed, I would say policy, they have tried to protect uh, these people because among them, uh, almost uh, 50 to 60 percent of those people are actually below the poverty line so i think these are the reasons why india has very closely guarded uh, this sector now if you look at use side then use uh, average tariff is definitely quite low i mean if you look at the average tariffs then it would be around 11 it was 11 percent in 1990 and that has come down to 4.6 percent in 2020 so it is much less than and that's what I was, uh, you know, in the beginning, I was telling that even if we go for an FTA and it is only based on tariff, then the major benefits are going to go to European Union because already their tariffs are quite low. And uh, if you look at the product, then the major product which European Union, Union is actually protecting is dairy product. That to the, you know, the tariff is only 16%. So these are the major issues if you look at you know tariffs but if you look at the other part which is non-tariff measures then non-tariff measures i would say are majorly affecting our trade uh, especially the non-tariff measures are by the european union uh, they have tvts they have sps and that is hugely affecting our uh, you know agricultural exports not only that uh, already we have made representations to the european union and uh, on these issues and what has happened is that what has been found is that uh, let's say the residue limits and other kinds of requirements are much higher in case of the products which are coming from india than normally is there in you know let's say products from other countries or the trade between other countries so their residue limits are in fact much higher and it has already been reported so these are the i think uh, major challenges when we look at the trade in agricultural products between these two countries. Right. Uh, so having said that, uh, you know, you have highlighted some concerns in your analysis regarding the FTA negotiations. And if this FTA is, un, un, you know, finalized, so what kind of uh, challenges can uh, uh, come up for Indian agricultural uh, producers and exporters? And uh, also, how can India be, you know, address these challenges during the negotiation stage itself so what would you like to say on this point yeah so here uh, the problem uh, see why i have some 
first hand information on this because we were doing this project uh, for the ministry and also in one of the projects which involved UK. I personally was the lead researcher and we did it for UK aid. So what I found was that if you look at the from the negotiation point of view, then what we found was that they were always very sensitive about this right from the beginning. They didn't want us to tell that, you know, non-tariff. Once you say something non-tariff, then they said, no, it is uh, the, at the early stage, please let us not, you know, discuss these things, then the talks will not go further and all those things. And they then try to, you know, I would say, you know, divert our attention to certain other aspects. Whereas the, what we found was in our study that if you actually look at the non-tariff barriers which are imposed on India's uh, agricultural export items, and if we really calculate the non-tariff equivalent of those items, then they are substantially high. And if we, and also we did some studies on if they are removed by how much, you know, trade can improve and trade can improve by more than, you know, 20 to 30% if those are removed. So definitely the major issue here is non-tariff. And when we look at it from the negotiation point of view, how we should approach it, then it should be definitely uh, during the negotiation, the Indian negotiators would look at the compliance requirement, uh, mutual recognition. Uh, then they should also look at, uh, you know, uh, not only, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the treated agreement uh, negotiations, but also uh, we should also represent to the WTO because in WTO is a forum where we can also take these issues and where this can be resolved with our trading partners by looking at the notifications. We have to very carefully look at the notifications and not only just looking at the notifications, how the notifications can actually uh, hinder trade because there can be several notifications. Some of them might be valid. It might be because of, you know, protection of animal plant safety or the human safety and health and other things. So they might be, you know, actually valid. But we should, our uh, major, uh, you know, uh, I, I should say effort should be in the direction where we, we know that that is more than that. It is actually trying to create a barrier. So we should distinguish between non-tariff measures and non-tariff barriers. So that's where the negotiators have to be taught. They have to be knowledgeable and they have to go to the table with all this knowledge and also some back of the envelope calculations, which will tell them that if we can calculate the non-tariff value uh, equivalent, then if that is reduced by certain percentage, then by how much the trade can increase. So these are the issues I think which will be very important and uh, each uh, you know round of negotiation we should be closer to you know our objective rather than not you know diverting because they will try to divert that we have already seen. Uh, although uh, you know it's uh, there are two very different kinds of partners I just was curious to know your view on uh, how has the negotiation with UK progressed in parallel to the negotiation with the EU and how the issues or the opportunities are different for India in both cases and uh, you know is there something which we have done there some learning which we would be doing there which can be leveraged in the India EU negotiations which are happening because that is very close to signing as far as we understand. Yes so yeah that is a you know actually a very good question so if you look at see where it is in case of UK where we are stuck we are UK we are stuck uh, because there are a lot of barriers they are creating for movement of people. Visa issues are there. So ultimately, we are looking at UK uh, majorly, I would say, not only for agricultural products, but majorly also for the services. So that is hugely, you know, there is a lot of restriction and especially when Brexit has happened. And that is majorly due to the fact that the people in Britain, they are worried about people from other countries coming in and taking their jobs. And so they have now become very sensitive about it. So I think that is an issue which has, uh, which is where we are now, you know, the stocks are stalled. And if that is not resolved, I don't think very quickly it will be signed. My idea is it will not very, it will not be very quickly signed. So if you look at, if you take our learnings from there, then again, I would say that of course, yeah, UK coming out of EU, I think is a major, uh, yeah, it has created major potential for India's increased trade with EU. And what will happen is that 
India can also look at certain services sectors. India can look at increasing the trade in agricultural goods also. In fact, we have done a very detailed analysis of agricultural products. And what we found was that intra-EU trade is also huge. If you look at, if you compare EU with other, uh, you know, uh, regions, then intra-EU trade will be around 79 to 80%. So, which means that it is very difficult to break that, uh, you know, supply chain. So, uh, and what we found was that if we like, we were also talking about complementarity. I found that India's complementarity with EU is very high. So, if you to look at in a scale of 0 to 10, 100, then around 68 is the complementarity. Now, which means that whatever India is exporting to the world, EU is importing from the world. But EU is not importing that from India. So we tried to find out why. And even we found some surprising things. It is not only because of tariff or non-tariff. Actually, there are quality issues. So the same product which is being exported by India uh, to, let's say, you know, uh, Switzerland or uh, let's say you know Germany that same product is also uh, you know exported by let's say Poland but the problem that we found is that even when the unit value is much higher for the product from Poland it is still being bought by them one of course somebody can say that it is because of transportation cost but it is also much beyond transportation cost actually quality becomes an issue and also since food products are majorly cultural products so also there is a kind of you know consumer preference towards uh, certain food products coming from certain places so that is very difficult to circumvent but other than that if we look at processed food uh, then i think there is a lot of potential right so actually coming to the processed food question because you know uh, the government has a strong thrust behind uh, boosting the exports of processed food products uh, so, in the case of EU, do you see any discernible shift? Because I uh, was looking at some, uh, you know, remarks uh, recently that our share of processed food in the total exports has increased. But has this also uh, happened in the case of India, EU? And how do you think we can accelerate it, it further? Okay. So, if you look at, uh, you know, our processed food exports to EU, then around 12% of our processed food we are actually exporting to EU. And uh, so, and if you look at uh, who is our major market uh, within EU, then you will see that it is majorly Netherlands where we are sending a lot of, uh, you know, uh, processed food products. And uh, so we are uh, majorly, what are we majorly sending there? These are basically uh, fish products and uh, you know products like crustaceans and then vegetable oils oil cakes these are the products which we are sending to you and uh, uh, and it is increasing over time so there is a lot of potential for processed food in european union but again as i have said actually the major problem is quality and also a number of uh, restrictions uh, which are in the form of non tariff barriers which are there which is actually hindering our exports to European Union. So I think that from the point of view of, uh, you know, increasing the exports to this region, we should, uh, you know, use the negotiations that are happening between India in case of India EU FTA. And we should be actually trying to look at the compliance requirements, how we can better comply with those requirements, whether we require any certification agencies within our economy, we can develop them, or should we develop our own standards, or should we use the multilateral route? All this should be carefully weighed, and then uh, we should decide our way forward. Right, right. So actually, I wanted to extend this discussion more generally across markets. Also, how do you see the present impact of regulatory challenges on agri trade in the global market? Do you see uh, the these uh, kind of regulatory uh, instances growing in the past few years? And uh, how can uh, you know governments address this issue or exporters address these challenges? So, see, I think, uh, you know, there is a marked shift after COVID. So, there's a marked shift in the different kinds of uh, restrictions that have come up. Uh, 
post covid and majorly the countries are citing health and other hazard hazardous kind of uh, reasons for restricting our trade though they are allowing let's say vaccines and other kind of products uh, their uh, exports are being allowed uh, all over the world because that is what is required and that uh, product everybody cannot produce but i would say in general agricultural uh, products they are facing a you know lot of challenges uh, like also uh, in major uh, developed countries which are our major uh, i would say markets in the major developed countries uh, they are protecting the agricultural sector through tariffs and non tariff barriers because the major reason is that their cost of production is much higher than ours so if they want to compete with our agricultural products there is no other way secondly if you look at the kind of technology differences then we our technologies are more labor oriented more labor intensive their agriculture is very very capital intensive in even in some of the developed countries actually agriculture is more capital intensive than manufacturing so naturally what they are doing so these are basically not controlled by like individuals might be there are corporations uh, behind them and they have a very very strong lobby and that is actually creating hindrance for the governments to you know liberalize uh, you know the agricultural sector so i think that what our governments can do is number one they can uh, again and again i am saying that even if number of regional trading agreements have increased many fold after the uh, you know institution of the wto in 1995 but even then uh, if you look at the trade that has taken place in the world there is a lot of studies on you know which have happened there actually trade is majorly taking place through multilateral route it is not the preferential route so again and again we should take help of the dispute settlement mechanism dispute settlement body and we should push our uh, you know uh, exports through our uh, you know uh, uh, i would say cases we can you know uh, uh, file in those courts and for that we need to create the capacity we need to have our own lawyers even today the number of lawyers who can actually try such cases are much less in india almost neg negligible so we need to create that capacity and we need to fight our cases and once we start doing that only then i think this uh, you know barriers are going to come down otherwise since uh wto has come in 1995 and after that plethora of regional trading agreements have been signed tariff is not a major issue the actual issue is non tariff barriers and other kinds of compliance requirements these are covert measures which are actually being used against us and that is restricting our exports actually our exports are at least 20 to 30% lower than it should be and it is because of only i i would say non tariff barriers okay okay uh, thank you sir for that uh, explanation and finally i would like to ask you uh, you know uh, when you look at agricultural export trends generally over the past few years uh, how do you see uh, india's growth as an agricultural exporter and since it's one uh, among the largest producers of commodities uh, what steps do you think uh, can uh, india take to enhance competitiveness in exports because we don't see the same uh, you know kind of uh, ranking in exports as we see in uh, agricultural productivity so how can uh, our competitiveness be improved overall in the international market okay so if you if you look at uh, you know the products which are doing very well from india then you will see that within the agricultural products majorly fruits nuts dairy produce beverages fish crustaceans meat edible oils animal and vegetable fats preparations of cereals these are the major products which are now being exported from india and if you look at our competitiveness if we calculate that to let's say reveal competitive advantage it is much higher than one so we also have competitiveness there is no problem but if you analyze our destination markets so our destination markets are majorly uh, us eu and if you look at then uh, here uae china so if you look at our destination markets then majorly the, you will see that the hindrance is coming again i will mention that it is from the non tariff barriers and i have already told you that how we should tackle it there are various ways you can tackle it also if you look at the responsibility of the industry associations in our country or the export promotion bodies 
then they should actually create awareness among the producers they should create awareness among the producers related to the product varieties which are being demanded in the world market so that the producers know that which kind of product should be actually produced given the increasing demand in the world market what are the requirements in terms of uh, sps uh, standards that is required by those countries if they are requiring some kind of certifications where they should be going for those certifications and uh, if uh, we can develop the standards ourselves like uh, i think indian government has now designated the bureau of indian standards as a nodal body for this for tbt so there are various ways through which we can actually generate this kind of knowledge formation which will help us to actually tackle certain issues which are not only related to the i would say productivity or efficiency of production but also related to other costs which are associated for making our produce export ready right sir so uh, that wraps up our edition for today uh, thank you so much for those very interesting insights which cover a range of important issues pertaining to indian agri trade and it was indeed a pleasure uh, talking to you today and uh, thank you so much for being with us thank you thank you for giving giving me this opportunity thank you